Good afternoon and welcome to everyone. Welcome to this conversation that will gather our thoughts and focus our spirits, the language of our souls, the visual poetry of Harvey Johnson. This moment is a wonderful privilege to be in conversation with three generations of healing through the arts. Now, you may wonder why I say three generations when you're looking at two. <laughs> well, it's because we have the life and voice of John Biggers, represented by our guest, Harvey Johnson, and Delita Martin. And so I welcome you to this conversation on the language of our souls. And to begin this conversation, art is a broad category that holds many different expressions such as poetry, painting, sculpting, music. In the seminary, we will even talk about the art of preaching. <laughs> Many people who heard about this exhibition and heard that there would be an opportunity to come and have conversation, they may have said, I'm going to Phillips to meet the artist, to meet the painters. But I would like to hear from both of you how you identify what you do with the different mediums? And what are the resources, the sources of your inspiration? <laughs> Let the leader. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for this conversation. Thank Phillips for being here. Um, this is an incredible honor to um, stand shoulder to shoulder with my mentors. And um, it's a very humbling time as well. But um, my inspiration is everything around me. And I tell people oftentimes, I'm always working in my head. I'm, when, when I'm talking to you, I'm working. I'm looking at the patterns. I'm looking in your faces. I'm looking in your eyes. And I'm being inspired all the time. Um, in terms of mediums, um, I feel like when I left the university, you know, when you're in school and you paint, you're taught to be a painter, so you make paintings. When you draw, you know, when you major in drawing, you, you're taught to draw pictures or, you know, printmaking, you're taught to make prints. But when I left academia, it was about being close to creation for me. It was about having an intimate relationship with, um, the medium that I was using in order to be a conduit for the stories of the women in my community. And so um, the moment I gave myself permission to be the visual storyteller that I am, um, it just opened up everything for me. It opened up all my senses to um, think about, remember oral tradition, um, you know, look at my community and become inspired by my community, become inspired by, you know, the elders in my community. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm inspired by everything around me. Well, uh, basically, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, my big brother Lee here. We all call Dr. Lee Butler. And... Um, and Nancy, Dr. Nancy Pittman, the president of this wonderful seminary, and the staff, uh, Holly, back there, and uh, Mr. T, I call him Mr. T, Terry Ewing. He's standing up in the back, all the way in the back there. But they all are very forward in doing what needed to be done in establishing this wonderful exhibition. And uh, I want to thank... Uh, the holiest of spirits. I want to thank my spirit guide. 
I want to thank the spirit of my ancestors. I want to thank the spirit of earth, wind, fire, water, and minerals. I want to thank uh, the spirit of animals, especially elephants, dolphins, and birds for myself. Now, you all have to choose your own, uh, which is cool, you know? And uh, all of that means a tremendous uh, uh, amount of, of spiritual energy. And so I want to do that. And like uh, Dr. Butler, I want to, I thought about, I heard about uh, Harry Belafonte. I always thought of him as uh, an activist for human rights, and not just civil rights, but human rights, as well as an actor, uh, a speaker of renown. And uh, so he has transitioned. He has moved from body to spirit. And uh, he has completed the circle and uh, returned to the source, which we all would do. And uh, my mother was the icon that I use as uh, a point of reference. Uh, she taught us the meaning of our spirituals, Negro spirituals that uh, I refer to as African spirituals because I see myself as an African. I don't see myself as a, a Negro. I don't see myself as an African-American because if I'm an African-American, then that means I'm not African and I'm not American, but I'm an African-American. Well, that's like a hybrid to me. So I decided I want to be an African. On the way, I was looking at all these a, a M E churches uh, as we were driving, Russell, who's sitting there and uh, driving us down the road. And those are African churches, you know? Richard Allison and Lawson Jones, African Methodists. They didn't say anything else, so. And um, so uh, my mother taught us African, what I consider Africanisms that I saw in Africa when I went to Sierra Leone. And um, in many different ways, I'll start with the quilts that uh, my colleague Alita was speaking about. We all share the same, that same symbol and the meaning of it because those symbols which you will see in both of our words, you see the six-pointed star, you see wash pot, you should see uh, wash boards, you will see uh, turtles, fish, boats, and so forth. And all of those have symbolic meaning relative to uh, my mother and her teachings uh, for her children uh, in a moral sense. Uh, so my work starts off with, if you would look at all of it, it's the mother. The mother is the female principle of the creation of the cosmos and the creation of all of us. Because all of us come from an African mitochondria DNA, whether we want to recognize it or not. And I don't care what color we are. It does not matter. It has to do with mitochondria DNA that was discovered some a hundred and, well, it's, a, it's at least 150,000 years ago that came from a black woman. Uh, you may argue about that, but uh, it's a fact, it's a truth. And we have to, we have to, and which is what my work is about also, one has to have the courage to face the truth. Doesn't matter what color you think you are, you know? I don't consider race as a, uh, as something of importance. It's a misnomer. There's no such thing as race. You know, you're not a race. I'm not a race either. You see, I'm not black. 
you know, I was talking to my daughter and I was like, trying to get her, you know, talk about black is this and that and the other. She said, no, daddy, she said, I'm brown, you know. I said, you know, you're right, baby, you are brown, aren't you? You know, so your, what you are, has, your color has to do with what you are, but it has nothing, it says nothing about who you are, you know. And who I am is, I'm an African visual poet. And I choose the word poet because poetry expresses a deeper meaning of the human journey in answering the questions about what, where, when, how, and why of our existence, you know, of our being. Art doesn't do that. I'm not an artist, okay? Beyonce is an artist, but she's not a poet, okay? So that's, and I'm not doing it, I'm not saying this out of arrogance. I'm not saying this, uh, you know, out of machoism or whatever other words you want to use to uh, talk about somebody who's uh, narcissistic, you know. I'm not none of those things, you know. My mother did teach me that way. And if you look at these works, you, you will see that. You will see the, the love. Because I love my people which uh, is uh, um, uh, a microcosm of a whole macrocosm of my love for all of you, because we're all the same. We're all in the same boat, you see. But we all have to come from our own identity, our own purpose, our own meaning. So I come from an African perspective. Somebody else may come from a European aesthetic, you know? I mean, you look at all of the, uh, the art, quote unquote, art in Europe, right? You ain't gonna see no black folks in those paintings. You know what I'm saying? Unless they're doing portraits and stuff like that. What? They're doing their own aesthetic, right? I got to do my own aesthetic. And, and in these works, there's no European or American aesthetics in these works. I don't deal, in other words, with. Um, uh, the diminution of, a, of space, for example, or putting a line out there and let everything go big and then get small. Or I, no, not at all, because it's symbolic. So I'm using the turtle to symbolize the meaning of the sun and the path of the sun uh, across the, uh, it, it, uh, what do they call that? The equator, but it's a celestial equator because the sun do move, you see? So the turtle is a symbol of the sun. And then I use, I have other symbols like the washboard. I use the washboard as a symbol. And all of my symbols have double layers of meaning, okay? I'm only giving you one meaning, right? Of maybe each item. The washboard has a symbol of the changing of the body or going from body to spirit, you know? When one dies and the soul releases, right? You see? At least that's what we feel and think, you know? It's the invisible, you know? And uh, on the other hand, it's a symbol of the pathos of our 400 year experiences in this country that we're still experiencing. That's also a part of the work. My work is not to be enjoyed, it's to, be, it's to illuminate your consciousness to enlighten your consciousness, to allow you to deeply face your truth. As the leader was saying last night, to look in that mirror and, and tell yourself, what do you see? And to have the courage to accept what you see and to heal what you see, because that's what it's all about too. But I can go on and on and on and on, you know what I mean? <laughs> and talk about my work, but uh, you know, do you have any questions? Or, I, that would be fine, you know. But I was just giving you, you know, some essences of some things that uh, that you might be thinking of, or that uh, I would want to convey to you. Okay. Thank you. I count this as a a rare moment, a very important moment that has to do with generations, and you've already identified the ancestral realm. And so earlier, I invoked the name of John Biggers, 
who was an inspirational guide for you, Harvey, and uh, you've identified, deleted, that Harvey has been an inspirational guide for you. And so what I'd like for you to share with us, Harvey, is something of John Biggers, just for Biggers, to, to introduce us to him and then to share with us how he inspired you. And then I'm going to go to Delita to ask you to say something about Mr. Johnson that we don't know or might not know. <laughs> so, and, then something, and then something of how he's inspired you. Yeah. So you're dealing with the Trinity, huh? Yes. Uh, okay, well, John was my surrogate father. I couldn't have had a closer father. Of course, I had a biological father, of course, you know, and I forgive him for his wrongs. But uh, John was a different, uh, of a different uh, man. Uh, and, uh, of course, he's from Gastonia, North Carolina, right? And uh, he spent his years at the Hampton Institute, Hampton University now, under the renowned art educator, uh, Victor Lohenfeld. Victor Lohenfeld was from... Austria, he was an Austrian Jewish person. And he fled Hitler during the 30s. And the way he was able to, to leave Hitler was he put all of his work underneath and put all a lot of junk and stuff on top. And they were tired of going through the junk. So they never reached the real paintings that Lohenfeld had at the bottom of that trunk. And Lohenfeld came here and uh, he created a book, Creative and Mental Bros. And uh, John was inspired uh, to go to Hampton University where he was teaching. He decided that he wanted to go to an African school and teach and, and inspire in the African kids their own identity. That was the main thing, their own identity. Because over those 400 years, we think that we're white, some of us. And not white. In fact, there's no such thing as a white person. I've never seen a white person. I've seen an Irish person. I've seen a Spanish, I mean, Italian person, a Jewish person, a Polish person, you name it. But I ain't never seen a white person. Have you? Y'all ever seen a white person? Ain't nobody in this room white. You felt me walls. You see what I'm saying? I mean, we have to face those truths. And that's a part of healing. Because, and I'm still talking about John Biggers, because John taught us this. If you're going to heal, you first have to admit your sin, whether it's inward or outward. And admitting that sin, you have to make amends for that sin. But not through words, through actions, you see? This is what makes amends, right? You know? Ain't that right, yo? I just get a few heads waggling and went. <laughs> but after that, then there's what? Forgiveness. And my God, after that, there's redemption. And after redemption, there's freedom, right? You see? And that's what I'm trying to, and that's what John tried to instill in us about ourselves. Be yourself. Don't try to imitate whiteness or European aesthetics of people, you know? You're beautiful. You're worthy of the highest esteem. And so John taught technique, don't get me wrong. He was a teacher of technique, but not as in isolation though. Not as an intellectual exercise in itself but as a part of a deeply felt meaning of who are you? Who are you instead of who you're trying to be? You know, I, I used to try to be like John Wayne. I don't know if the, the early generation in there know about John Wayne. I didn't only try to be like John Wayne. I wanted to be John Wayne. But that's not, I'm not John Wayne. And I'm not white. I don't want to be white. I want to be human. I want to be myself, you see? 
And that's what we have to face in this country. And this is what John was trying to, trying to do. This is why a Caucasian woman, Miss Susan McShann, a patron, well, very wealthy patron, had the administration to bring John to Texas Southern University to teach these African kids their expression so they can stop imitating Picasso, Matisse, Mondrian, Renoir, or whoever, or Michelangelo even, right? So he established that art department in 1949. And lo and behold, I met him in 1962, and we clicked just like that. Why? Because I can hope I can say it this way. The very same quilt that he covered up with in Gastonia, North Carolina, I covered up with in Port Arthur. So, and there were a lot of other commonalities. That was our, my chance to really express myself and John provided that chance. John had a UNESCO fellowship. And when he came back from Africa, he created the book Anansi. And in Anansi, he talked about the spider because there are a lot of Anansis out there, right? A lot of stories of Anansi out there. But this Anansi story had to do with the meaning of creation and how the, and, and in short, how the spider, this spider created these concentric circles that became a personification of God, the eye of God. And personification of the rays of the heat of the sun, you see? And how God taught Anansi uh, husbandry and agriculture and uh, all of the tools that were necessary to create a harmony between human beings, between nature and the cosmos, you see? So those things became sacred. Earth, wind, fire, water, minerals, all of those things became sacred. Why? Because we are part of all of those elements. We are oxygen. You go to the doctor and they, talk, they test your oxygen out, right? Your oxygen level, right? We're, so we're that. We're water. Most of us, you know, all of us have a majority of water. Well, there's water out there too, you see. And then we're part of the earth. That what covers all of our organs and so forth and so on. And then the air, earth, wind, fire. The fire, the heat, we all have heat. You get under that cover at night, it's not the cover, it's the heat from you that's making you warm, you know? So John was teaching us that. So he teaches us to respect those things. Don't pollute the water. Don't, don't put uh, whatever that stuff they put in the water to pollute it. Don't cut down the trees. They give you oxygen, you know? Don't pollute the air. All of those elements John taught to us were sacred, you see? So that's how he taught. You want to know something about color? Go out there and sit down and look at nature. Look at how light transforms the meaning of a green from almost a black, blue, green to almost a, a yellowish orange or a yellow, yellow, green. You know what I'm saying? She can tell me more about that because she deals with a lot of patterns and a lot of color. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But I mean, so this is what John, this is how John approached, approached teaching. And this is what, uh, you know, we learned from John, you know. And um, I tell you, it was one of the most wonderful conversations that you can have with anyone. Really, I was so fortunate to meet this genius of a man this man of a man, because he didn't think of himself. He had all kinds of honors, all kinds of honors. But he said, just call me John. Don't call me Dr. Begas. <laughs> you know what I mean? But anyway, that's a small snippet of how John Begas taught technique, expression, and married the two to create all of the elements of art composition to convey imagery, I see. Well, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of a background so you can understand um, the importance of Mr. Johnson being my teacher and my mentor. So I 
I went to a predominantly white high school. And so I never, actually all through my school years was predominantly white, but I never saw art that looked like me. I saw my father create art at home and I knew that he was an artist. And my first, um, I guess I've always heard stories about Dr. Biggers. My father would tell me about, you know, times when he was in class and experiences that he had at Texas Southern University with Dr. Biggers and Mr. Sims. And it was just magical hearing those stories. But I still wasn't seeing um, works of art that looked like me. And um, I remember my fourth grade teacher telling me that I was using color incorrectly, but she never showed me how to, to use color. And I was ashamed. I was embarrassed. I, I felt less than. And so, but I never stopped creating. It never stopped me from creating. It just kind of stifled me, I say. So fast forward, I knew at, you know, from the time I was in kindergarten. Oh, was she? Ben, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I forgot. Oh, my God. Um, I knew that I was going to go to Texas Southern. I was going to study with Dr. Biggers. I was going to be an artist, and I was going to be a full-time studio artist. And I knew all of this, and most of that happened. Except Dr. Biggers was, um, he retired by the time I got there. And so I remember meeting Mr. Johnson on my first day of, of um, going to the Fairchild Gym to sign up for my classes. And I didn't know who he was. I had no idea he was even in the art department. And um, we we're talking, and I remember him telling me that Dr. Biggers was his father. And I was like, really? I was like, I was like in awe. But um, I wanted to tell you that early story because the important thing to me, you may not know this, but Mr. Johnson taught me how to see versus looking. Because see, I had been looking before and drawing, but I wasn't seeing. And in order to see, it required you to feel, it required you to connect, it required an intimacy between you and your work, and he taught me that. And that's something, you know, that's a lesson that I've always tried to um, share with my students and people that come in to my studio. But I remember being in class and I had, you know, I was pretty proud of my drawing at that time on that day. And I remember I took it up to Mr. Josh, he looked at it, he was like, okay, that, that's really good. And he says, I need you to change these hands. And I was like, okay, cool. I go back to my desk and I'm thinking, why does he want me to change? I've been doing this like the whole semester. And so I walk back over to him and I said, Mr. Johnson, I've been drawing hands like this. Why do I need to change them now? Why are you telling me to change them now? And what he told me was, you would not have understood what I was saying to you three weeks ago, but your drawing has progressed to a point where you can understand me now. So he was teaching me where I was and, and helping me to grow into the artist that I am. And I'm forever grateful <laughs> for that. Oh, great. And, <laughs> and just, you know, again, um, you know, saying he talked to us students, you know, he got to know us and, and asked us the, the really hard questions and, and had us to face those hard questions so that we could understand who we were and, and who we are as visual storytellers and what that really means. And now she's teaching me. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I, he, that's not a, I'm just saying that. But he was teaching me also, and he wasn't even there. I remember getting to graduate school and I had never made prints before. I had seen him and Dr. Biggers make prints. That was the first time I'd ever really seen printmaking. And I said, mental note to myself, one day I'm gonna learn how to make prints. And so I told my husband, you know, I'm gonna go to graduate school and I'm gonna go for printmaking. And it was really interesting because I was like the only person 
in the class, I didn't have a degree in printmaking, undergraduate degree, nor did I understand process. So I'm that one person in class that's raising their hands and everybody's like, oh God, here she goes again. <laughs> but I remember being frustrated because my drawings were not translating into printmaking the way they should. And I tried calling you. <laughs> I tried calling anybody that knew how to get in touch with him and I was unsuccessful. But I remember going home, complaining to my husband after a really hard crit. And, you know, I talked, I must have talked to him for like an hour in the middle of the night. And he's like, okay, okay. Uh -huh. And I go to sleep and I have this dream. And in the dream, I said, Mr. Johnson, I've been looking all over for you. He says, well, here I am. And I said, well, could you look at my work for me? And he said, of course. And in this dream, he's looking at my work. And he said to me, I'm very disappointed. And I said, I know. And he says, I'm disappointed because you know how to do the work, but you forgot to be the artist. And I was so focused. I had forgot what he had taught me because I was so focused on process. I forgot to be spiritually connected to the work. So <laughs> that. Well, I'm also, I'd like to say, though, uh, I introduced D to printmaking, but she took printmaking far above my head. I mean, she knows things I've never even heard of, and she could teach me about print. I could be in her class. And that's the honest, you know, if you, I don't call her a student, she's my colleague. Is it? I'm still working on it. And she, <laughs> yeah, she hasn't still gotten that yet to her system yet, you know. But she is, though, you know? And I'm her student now. You got me? And that's a fact, really. Honest to God, Tris. Mr. Lee. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share a few terms with you that I see as being embedded in this exhibition. A few terms. Africana. Spirituality. Healing and ritual, Africana, spirituality, healing, and ritual. Now, at some point, I may give some definition to these terms, but for the moment, I want to leave them undefined as a part of my experiencing this exhibition. And so as you each embody and embrace African spiritual traditions. And I see you both pouring yourselves out as a libation into this work. What is your hope for America? Oh, yeah. Kindness, forgiveness, <laughs> and grace. Um, I think what breaks my heart. Um, you know, there are people in here who are older than me, but in my lifetime, I don't think I've ever seen a period where we have less grace than what we have now. Um, we're in a culture of cancel, cancellation, canceling people, but we're not um, leaving room for grace, redemption, and those things. So I'm hoping my prayer is that when people see my work, that they will look at themselves and look at others the way they want to be seen. So. Wow, that's um, that's a loaded question, really. Um, it's like I have a double the thought about it, you know, on one hand, you know, I see the yang, and on the other hand, I see the yin. <laughs> In other words, I'm hoping against hope that, that America be what America is supposed to be. Basically, what America is supposed to be. We were not in the Constitution. 
women were not in the Constitution. There's a lot of men who had slaves and wanted to dominate and control and so forth and so on. So I'm hoping that America be um, a human freedom and open up the doors of liberty for everyone. And that that Statue of Liberty in uh, New York Harbor stands for something, right? Now it doesn't stand for anything. So far as I'm concerned, you know, I wasn't an immigrant. I was brought over here to work in the fields to make a few people rich. Well, I hope America can turn that around and bring about truth and equality and justice for all so that we can uh, we can release the chains of bondage that we now carry and be free people and look at each other as human beings and act and interact as human beings. That's what I hope. So that our generations or many generations to come would not have perished in vain for anybody's progress. You see? That's what I hope. Hey. Delita, there are often spirit figures in your work. Yeah. And it's been suggested that the more modern we become as people in the world, the more distance is created between the natural and the spirit worlds. When I met you in your studio, you were very clear to say spirituality is important. And you wanted to know do I recognize that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> and so say something about spirituality as it relates to what you share with us. Um, in my mind, I have always had a distinction between religion and spirituality. And for me, spirituality has... Um, always been about an intimate connection with, um, I guess, the intangible, the, the invisible. Um, you know, you walk into a room and you feel something, you know, you feel a certain way. You, you, you can sometimes get spooked or you start to reminisce, but there's that fingerprint that spiritual print that's left in that space that you're reacting to, that you're, you're trying to figure out how do I, how do I fit into this space? How do I marry into this space? And we don't pay attention to that. But if you listen to children, they do. Children are so um, in tuned with the spiritual side of who we are and who they are. And as adults, we're often too busy telling them, oh, that's not real or that doesn't exist. Um, but we're in that space all the time, all the time. Our, our ancestors are always with us. Our spirit guides are always with us. We just need to pay attention. And I feel like for me, um, that, that has always been the, the foundation of my studio. When I thought about, um, Dr. Vigor's telling me not to ever miss an opportunity to uplift my people. I felt like I have to remember my ancestors. I have to remember my great grandmother. I have to remember the stories about my great great grandmother in order to keep her alive, to keep her memory alive, to keep her traveling with me. Um, I remember talking to my grandmother about her mother, Rebecca. And I love listening to stories about her. And I remember having a dream about Rebecca and it was so vivid. She came into my room and she hugged me and she kissed me and she told me she loved me. Mm -hmm. 
and she missed me. And um, she told me that, you know, she's like, you're so beautiful and I love you. Do you know who I am? And in the dream, I told her, yes, I did. But when I woke up, I, I really didn't. But when I woke up, I instantly knew who it was because she was wearing the same thing she was wearing in her casket. And so at that moment, I think I was about 13 or 14 years old. At that moment, I understood keep, keeping the memory, the oral tradition, the visual storytelling. It all came together for me and made sense. Wonderful. I think it's very appropriate that you share a bit with us about these two works that you were inspired to bring forth after being here in Tulsa last year. And this is a rare opportunity <laughs> for all of us. Yeah. So I don't know which one you would like to begin with, but say something about these two works that came out of your experience here related to the Tulsa Race Massacre. Oh, yeah. Should you bring me that, uh, that package on the side? That's true. On the side. Please. I, uh, I wrote a poem. I'm not a writer. I wrote a poem. I'm looking at uh, Dr. Eckert here. And, and the, po the poem explains the entire meaning of both of those works, okay? So I hope I don't bore you, but I want you, I want to say something about that because I put a lot of effort in it. <laughs> and when I wrote it, Oh, yeah, here it is. And um, well, first of all, I'm still grieving over Tulsa 1921. I'm still grieving. I'm still in, in that period. I've not stopped grieving. When you think in terms of those babies and mothers shot down in the street and the men and families just torn apart and the whole Greenwood district destroyed by racism. Who are these people? Where did they come from? With deputies, sheriffs deputizing men to go out and murder just because they were jealous of black people creating an autonomy for themselves. What's wrong with these people? I don't know. All I know is that they're ill and they need, uh, they need some kind of redemption. So kind of, we need to keep praying. So, and that's what these two works are all about, the eulogy on your left and the elegy on the right. And I'm gonna talk about the symbols in a minute, but I wanna read this poem to you so you can get the whole concept of both of them, okay? Honestly, I get angry. I'm not in despair uh, about it all, but I'm angry about it, you know, because it hasn't stopped. So I call it the bells and ring, sounds of crack, smack, and watch. See our African ancestors through the doors of no return, where men, not faith, F-A-T-E, nor faith, F-A-I-T-H, the creed, mad barbaric savagery. Hear the screams below the ships of death, mamas and babies, overboard is best. A sharp speed swirls open the light, the ocean curls a bloody red sight. Where's the God to save, if any? 
of Holocaust ignored by many. 400 years plus here keeps coming. The cop crows at the break of dawn, ancestors seek energy, a warning has come. The seas and oceans clear and plain, the bells and ring can never be the same. But those with blinders, they see only their way. Blonde and airy and skinny need one of his kind who makes us bleed. 400 plus years of the egg and the sword, war after wars, sacrifices are made, African valor, but still a slave. Why not the sacrifices brought freedom's rewards? Religion has failed us time and time again to yield to justice a never-ending sin. Maybe the right savior for us to come and Mother Nature has just begun. For in her womb, a rotted egg tossed into the world, a living dead with deceptive tombs for the living blind, a crack in the seam, a final sign. Not soon enough for the deserving some, but much too soon for the little ones. Much too soon for the little one. The empire smacked for the living in, not the what, just only when. Mimicking Rome, his decadent brother, both with hatred for the African mother. Crack smack and whack for sure, sounds to be feared. For I see the storm on the horizon, a storm that's almost here. That's the meaning of the two. And I use symbols and the eulogy. You see the mother, her head is in white, and she's crying a tear. There's a tear coming down, if you look at it closely, on her, in her right eye. I mean, I left that. And uh, she's confident the young, the little boy and the little girl. And she's wearing her, crow, her uh, <laughs> inverted pyramid, the six-pointed star. Okay. All right. And she's holding in her hand the ink, A-N-K, of life. It's uh, what you all call Egypt. Egypt's real name is Kemet. It's not Egypt. It's K-E-M-E-T. It's Kemet. And Africa is not Africa. Those are Greek words. Africa's real name is Akubalan. You can Google this in your, your uh, phones and you'll see this, okay? I'm not just talking off the top of my head. And then above you see the, the mother and child the moaning doves, moaning the carnage that these people created, burning down this whole town. That, you know, and what amazes me is, you're talking about Africans who were enslaved and all of those years, and then came back to create an independent town. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Who can do that? Well, certainly the folks crossed down didn't think so. They got jealous. Plus the color of the skin made them matter. You know, let's face the truth. Let's not, uh, how you call it uh, when you're... Sugarcoat? Yeah, sugar. Don't, let's not sugarcoat things, y'all. We have to face the truth so that we can be free. That's the part of the healing. And that's why I truly love the Phillips Theological Seminary, because they're making it happen. I've never seen a church produce or uh, have poetry that two Africans, the leader and myself, among others, uh, 
combined with their philosophy to create a meaning of justice, of truth, of enlightenment, of illumination. I I've never seen that before. To me, this is a very historical moment that all of us are experiencing. So the mourning doves, they mourn for the loss of those babies and those mothers. Old man walking in the street, somebody from a plane just shoot him down. You know, <laughs> you're talking about savagery. All right, I ain't going there. So then we see the moon. So they're mourning to the moon. The bloody moon, the moon has turned not real bright, you know, but there's the fog and the cloud over our heads. So this is what the eulogy is about, and then you get the silhouetted figures on the left, bottom left. They're reaching up and reaching out. So I call this the eulogy 1921 Tulsa. You were right, Russell. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. And then there's the allergy, of course. And can y'all see that? And uh, so in the elegy is a, is a lamentation of the 1921 massacre. And not just that, but the first one that started in 1863 in New York and came on down to the 2015, all the way across Texas, Oklahoma, right? Well, we know about that. But I'm just saying that so you're getting the, the Gamadion in the center on the left here. But it's the female principle of the creation. That's what's going on in the center there. And then you're getting the angelic figure at the bottom. It derives from our spiritual that we sang in the church, we sang in the church, called Two Wings to Veil My Face, Two Wings to Veil My Feet, Two Wings to Fly Away. Y'all familiar with that spiritual? Y'all heard that before? Yeah. So that's what the bottom figure is, and then you get the top figure with the wings also, the two wings, and they're kneeling in uh, reverence of the, of the pyramids, okay, in reverence of the uh, female principle of creation. All right. And then, of course, you get the two servants with the pots in their hand. And again, the pot is a double symbol of the mother's womb as well as the umbrella of the cosmic universe that envelops us all. So that's the double meaning, okay, of the pot. Also a meaning of, it has another meaning of the sun too, but that's a different story. And then you get the crescent moon. And on the crescent moon, these figures are passing figures. They're not figures that are earthly figures, but they're transitional figures but they stand together in unison with the three stars on the right, and each star represents each one of them. So you can see that. And then the, 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 the pots at the top, that's where the sun pots are. And uh, the uh, liquid of the fire changes to water from the orange all the way down to the white, you see. And it, the uh, and we, Behind the pots, you get the, uh, I tried to show the meaning of the of warmth of clouds. I tried to get that sense of what's going on that we don't see. And then you see the, all of the, the circles, the swirling circles. The swirling circles, are, I use that to tie into my composition, not from just an intellectual or technical point of view, but from the point of view of all of us being a circle, that we're all a circle, and we all return to the source, you see? And it's also a symbol of, I think I told you about Anansi, didn't I? Mm -hmm. So that's where that came from, you know? And that's, that's basically what the eulogy and the elegy is all about. It's one and the same, really, you know? 